Have you ever wished you could just wake up one day, reach across your nightstand, and hit the life reset button? Let's face it, the struggles and frustrations of everyday life leave millions of women and men around the globe yearning for a new way. And the new way is right here in Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want by Dr. Fujan Zain. You can get it now at fujan.com or amazon.com. Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want. You deserve it. So the largest ever study of age perceptions done in Michigan State University in 2018 finds good views of aging, which are not always in line with longer life expectancies. Does life really begin at 40? Is 50 the new 30? For people in this age group, the answer appears to be yes. I'm 57, believe me, I'll say yes. But for young adults in their teens and early 20s, turning 50 equates to hitting an old age. A new study of more than half a million Americans shows just how skewed views of aging can be, particularly among the young. The study by scientists from Stanford University, Michigan State University, and University of St. Thomas comes as people are living longer than ever. Life expectancy in the U.S. was about 79 years in 2015, up nearly nine years from 1965. But perception may not be keeping up with reality. Nearly 30,000 people in this study thought middle age starts at 30. Hmm. I find it interesting that there's a ton of people who have skewed perceptions about aging, mostly young adults. William Chopik said, he is the assistant professor of psychology at Michigan State University and the principal investigator of this research. Now, the study published in Frontiers in Psychology is the largest investigation to date of age perception, with 500,000 internet respondents ranging in age from 10 to 89. A key finding was that people's perception of old age changes as they age, essentially, the older we get, the younger we feel. I don't know about that. That's not my experience, but okay. I think the most interesting finding of this study is that our perceptions of aging aren't static. They change as we change ourselves. What you consider to be an old changes as you become old yourself. Part of this is understandable, he said. People view older adulthood as a negative experience and want to avoid it because it's painful to think of ourselves as old. But of course, older adults actually have really enriching lives, and some studies suggest that they're happier than younger adults. Interestingly, when asked how long they want to live, the different age groups gave different answers. While kids and young adults wanted to live into their 90s, that ideal age dropped among the 30 and 40 year old and um, hitting a low of about 88. But the ideal age started rising steadily, starting with 50 year olds and reached about 93 among 80 year olds. Well, that's what the research says. Now, we're going to actually also talk to an author, a best-selling author, who he actually went and observed for so many years, his own experience and observation, which turned into a beautiful book, John Leland. We'll be right back with John Leland. We the people of the world, in order to create a more perfect self and world. Join the conversation every Monday afternoon at 3 p.m. Pacific for Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fushan. Dr. Fushan has a direct approach to getting you to free your mind. Inner Voice is a live call-in show where you can chat about your life and all that matters to you in your relationships. Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fushan, Monday afternoons at 3 p.m. Pacific on Smart Talk, KMAT, 1490 AM, and on the internet stream. 
Were you recently injured in a car accident? Then you need the law offices of REF Data Car for your free case evaluation. Don't let the medical bills pile up and don't let the insurance companies try to settle your claim for a few hundred dollars. Call 714-464-3246. The law offices of REF Data Car serves all of California. If they don't win, you don't pay. So call now, 714-464-3246. This is a paid-for attorney advertisement by the law offices of Aria Thatikar of Orange, California. Welcome back to the Inner Voice Show. I'm Dr. Fujian Zay, and I'm so excited to have John Leland with me today. In his 30-plus years in journalism, John Leland has gone from chronically youth culture to writing about the oldest old. It's a fitting journey. Given the demographic trends he writes, your elderly parents are the vanguard that your kids think they are. A graduate of Columbia College, he worked as a senior editor at Newsweek and editor-in-chief of Details Magazine before joining the New York Times, where he has written for almost every desk at the paper. In 2015, he wrote, a year-long series following six people aged 85 and up, which became the basis for his new book, Happiness is a Choice You Make, Lessons from a Year Among the Oldest Old, a New York Times bestseller, as he wrote in the Times about the series and the book, no work I have ever done has brought me as much joy and hope or changed my outlook on life as profoundly. He's the author of two previous books, Hip, the history, and Why Kerouac Matters. Uh, welcome to my show, John. Dr. Fujian, I am so thrilled to be with here with you today because I get to talk about my six favorite people in the world and the lessons that they taught me about how to live a better life, whatever age we are. Yes, I um, read your book, actually listened to the audio um, in a book club that we have uh, with uh, a wonderful group, which we are probably, most all of us, uh, 50 and up. So as we were uh, reading this book and actually listening to it, I had this profound experience because I know that I've been having some problems with uh, the idea of aging. And some of it came from um, just seeing pain, people who go through physical pain or letting go um, of uh, their career or things that they have to do. And then uh, last year I lost my mother to um, Alzheimer's disease and she passed away. And then the past two years, I kept going back and seeing her and watching this woman who I knew of the strength uh, you know, kind of deteriorating. And I had put aging in synonymous with what I had experienced with her. Um, and then I read your book and it was like, wow. One sentence you said was profound for me. And it was, we view aging from the age we are. And from there, it doesn't look right or it doesn't look real. But when we are at a particular age, it feels and its reality is very different. And I remember when I was 18, I thought, I'll be done by 40. I'm just going to be complete with life. And 40 is the eldest that I could ever be. Well, I'm 57 and I'm ticking pretty well. So that sentence, as you said, it really resonated with me and brought up this whole hopefulness uh, and excitement about tomorrow versus the hopelessness and the pain that I thought I would have to face. So tell the, me about your experience. And the great thing about that feeling of hopelessness you get, uh, hopefulness you get, is that not only it makes life better when you're 90, it means life will be better when you're 90, but it makes your life better at 57 now, or if you're 42 or whatever age you are. Not being afraid of getting old uh, bring, just brings us great joy, makes, makes us able to uh, enjoy our lives now much more. And I have to say, one of the people in my book, and not, my book's Happiness is a Choice You Make, a 91-year-old woman named Helen Moses, she said the most depressing day of her life was when she turned 50 and thought, oh my gosh, now that I'm old. And, and now she's 90 and she's got new love in a nursing home and she says, I'm always happy. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome to hear that uh, the experience of uh, love and attachment and experience of just beauty 
uh, comes uh, at any age as you desire and you open your heart. So what got you into this project? What brought you to just go and be with these wonderful people for so many years? I started with a simple census number that the people age 85 and up were one of the fastest growing populations in the country. When I was born, there were fewer than a million, and now there's almost six million. So it's as if there were suddenly six times as many teenagers running around. So I wanted to know what their lives were like, and I wanted to know from the experts, the people who were living it. As you said, so much of what we think we know about old age comes from people who have never been old. So let's ask people who have lived long enough to know something about life, who have the whole book in front of them. What do they have to tell us? And so often in our culture, we think that they have nothing to tell us, and that we cheat ourselves and we cheat them by that. One of the uh, concepts that I always had as a therapist and um, a psychologist, what I thought was many times as I worked with, obviously, depression, the uh, elderly who face depression, had to do with um, not having the experience of uh, having a goal for the future, especially in the United States and Western world. We live on goals of the future, not much in the Eastern societies, but definitely on Western societies. And some of the depression showed up because um, there was nowhere to go. And if they were going to look at the future, they were just going to be looking at um, deterioration and death. And then going to the past experiences, some of them were not necessarily complete with their past or didn't have all of their relatives around to be able to experience that. Um, my experience of your book was a bit different as I read it. Can you share a bit about what is it that creates happiness for uh, the elderly as you experienced it? Well, it's a number of things. Uh, the first one that tipped me off was a sense of gratitude. I, I met a man who had a really hard life. He lived alone in a walk-up apartment. He was losing two toes. And I asked him his favorite part of the day, and he said, waking up in the morning and saying, thank God for another day, on my way to 110. And so that sense of gratitude really was, uh, was what enabled Fred Jones, this man, a retired civil servant, to be happy in this, in this difficult life. Because his gratitude meant, you know, not being that warm feeling you get when somebody gives you something, but a way of looking at the world all the time. So that was Fred. Uh, Jonas Meckes, his filmmaker, had a sense of purpose. And it may not be as forward-thinking as, as, uh, as it might have been when he was 20, 25. He wasn't thinking about what his purpose would be in 50 years. But he was thinking that what he had to do now made a difference and he was he was a filmmaker and artist and he felt he was responsible to those singers and troubadours and poets and saints of the past who did everything to make our lives more beautiful uh, i think giving up that idea that we have to be independent you know self-reliant pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and accept interdependence that we're going to accept help from people and we're going to try to help those people at the same time and finally i would say not being afraid of death. When we're afraid of death, it cheats life because uh, we, we don't value the moments that we're in if we, we deny the idea of death. I met a man named John Sorensen who said every time I met him, that he, every time I visited him, that he wanted to die. But John wanting to die meant that he was getting everything out of our conversation because it might be his last. Or if he listened to music, he was listening it to with absolute intensity because it might be the last time he heard it. So he was getting more pleasure out of life. His life was richer because he accepted his mortality. Two things as uh, you were talking came up for me. One was um, a sense of trust uh, that has to show up with the elder age with the interdependence, trusting that the people who are taking care of us, trusting that if we are at a facility or we are at home, but someone comes in to support us and is not necessarily family, that, um, that we're going to be okay in their hand. And we can allow ourselves to be in their hand and trust that another human being will take care of us, whether it's their job or not, and that they're going to do their job well. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest concepts of that type of dependence or interdependence that uh, comes for us, which rarely comes for us when we are younger. 
We look at, you know, the world from a cynical place. What do they want? Are they going to be good? Are they going to do their job good? And we have a sense of entitlement about it that it seems like at that age we need to give up the entitlement and really feel gratitude about everyone who's around us who's going to take good care of us. And then the other conversation as let's talk about this first and then uh, in what your experience was and then the second point I'll come I'll talk about it again well trust takes a lot of courage right it takes it's, it's a leap of faith that that person is going to take care of me and it, it I think people come to that courage by experience you've been through a number of experiences you're able to uh, one thing we know about the brain as it gets older is it loses certain capacities right it loses the capacity to multitask at speed well guess what multitasking makes people miserable but it does not lose to the same extent the ability to recognize patterns and i think trust comes from uh... making uh, comes from pattern recognition we trusted someone like that in the past that is a trustworthy person so we know what that looks like. So it becomes more possible to trust people. And then you get that feedback loop where your trust is repaid and you can feel gratitude towards them. And that becomes like, a, I think, a mutually reinforcing cycle. And a second uh, point that came up for me is living truly in the present moment. Uh, and enjoying, like you said, enjoying everything and, and allowing it to uh, impact every cell of your body. To like You're receiving every single thing that's out there, enjoying it, like you're drinking every experience that you could ever have to the fullest. Uh, and, and that present moment is almost like a lot of people might do meditation in order to train themselves to do that. Yet life will bring... Um, you know, the future and the present and the past and all of those and all that shows up for us uh, and not allowing us necessarily to be that present uh, every moment. Yet what you were talking about uh, as the experience of someone who is facing death or waiting for it or looking at it should, you know, it'll come up any day is really allowing themselves to enjoy every moment and being in a Zen moment kind of every moment. Because that moment be a, might be a large part of your life. You know, you think about it. If you think you have 80% of your life in front of you, all the value is on what isn't yet, right? What hasn't happened, all the stuff that's out there. If you have 10% of your life left to go, what's really valuable is, is what is, you know, your own experience. So you recognize the value of experience and you, and you, and you uh, place a, a greater uh, worth on that. So you're living in that moment because you realize that living is, is all there is to us. Mm -hmm. John, how has this experience changed you and uh, your life? Oh, my God, it's completely transformed me. And that's why I love talking about this stuff so much, because I was a grumpasaurus. You know, I'm a newspaper reporter. <laughs> we don't do happy. You know, I'm that Eeyore character who finds the misery and all the stuff. And I learned not to do that. I, you know, I had these six wise teachers and seven, really, if you include my mother, who's 89. And uh, I got an opportunity to see I, one of the things that Jonas Meck is one of the people, and it says, you know, have you ever thought about how amazing, truly amazing life is? And I thought, no, I haven't. But why have I not done that? And it was so simple and so difficult, you know, to, to remember to do it. And, and so, you know, I was completely transformed by this. I'm no longer afraid of death. I no longer take the, my, the bumps that I take. Personally, I understand that taking bumps and loss and sadness are part of life. They're not a punishment that was created just for me. Uh, I remind myself to live with a sense of purpose. It makes it easier to experience joy every day. And, and I make it a point to give thanks for the things that are good in my life, because that's almost all there is to my life. Mm -hmm. How has that changed your work? Are you still um, looking at things from a negative space? Like you said, a lot of the journalism goes into what's wrong with something or explaining what's wrong with something and uh, opening the negativity versus you know, talking about the positivity, because that's what we do in news and journalism. Um, how has that changed your work? 
I think I'm more open to the people that I meet and, and experience and write about in my work. I, I learned in the course of my time with these uh, people over 85 that I wasn't the expert. They were the experts, and I, my role was just to, to absorb what they were telling me, not necessarily to challenge it or argue against it. And uh, that has made me much more open to other people's experiences, and I can accept them and not feel threatened by them if their experience is different from my own. And when you talked, you named your book Happiness is a Choice You Make. Um, why choose the word happiness versus gratitude or uh, taking in uh, what brought the state of happiness as a state versus whatever else they were experiencing? That's an interesting question, and, and I've heard from people who work with people with depression and, and say, well, happiness isn't available to everybody, but gratitude and purpose and resilience and, and you know, interdependence and these other things are available to them. But to me, happiness, contentment, a sense of well-being, those are like the bigger category that all these other things fit into. And I would say, though, that the key word in that sentence, happiness is the choice you make, isn't so much happiness, it's choice. The happiness isn't the thing we choose, but it's the act of making the choice. And I think that applies to gratitude and purpose and, and joy and interdependence and, and, and fearlessness about death. I agree very much with you that uh, having the ability to choose and making the choice uh, gives us a lot more power uh, than uh, imagining that a state is there, that it either shows up for us or not, and we are uh, a passive bystander of it. So I totally agree with you. But you do, tell me about what your uh, idea of uh, cho choosing uh, when we are at any age, like let's say middle age to old age, uh, elder age, what are the choices that are different for us? And uh, where is it that we can make choice? My uh, guess is that many times people around 20s or 30s, it appears that they're making a lot more choices because they think that they have, they're, they're much more idealistic, they're the one who, uh, you know, create revolutions, take, take a stand for things. And a lot of times when people become older, they get a little bit more stagnated about um, resigning into things that have shown up, the, the things that they've tried but didn't work out. And many times they uh, have this kind of, I know it already, I've already been there, done that, took videos, and uh, they get very uh, resi resigned in those uh, ideas. And then therefore choices kind of go away. What is your experience of that as we age? Concepts well, I, of choice. I think the key thing about choice is we ha as we go through our days, we have things that happen to us. We have the stimuli, the external world, the, the, the things that come up in our lives. And we have our reaction to those things. And our sense of well-being and the life well-lived comes not from those things that come at us, but our reactions to those. And that's where we're making our choice. Uh, today, I made a decision that I would ride my bicycle to work and not worry about what would happen if it rained. So, of course, it rained. And I get to work, and I'm soaking wet, and I thought, well, I can spend my day dwelling on how uncomfortable I am being a little bit damp here at work, or I can think about how I avoided all the frustrations of the subway and the commuting and the cramming thing and how beautiful it was to ride along the Hudson River in the gray drizzle of the morning. And that was my choice. And it was a simple choice. And... Five years ago, I wouldn't have realized I had that choice. I would have just thought, oh, I'm damp and it's, I'm in the air conditioning and now I'm cold. And, but I can choose to view my life the second way, and it's much more richer and, and fulfilling and, and uh, more productive as well because I wasn't dwelling on, on the problems that I'd had during the day, but on the, the joys that the day has brought me. Uh and I, to add to that, I'm also experiencing with uh, mid and elder age is that sometimes uh, people are able to flow uh, more from ch one choice to another or when something like what you just said, this, their choice does not turn around to be um, 
as they wanted it to be or as they expected it to be or turned out the way they, they uh, wanted it, uh, that they're much more able to let go and flow and move uh, out of that resentment, uh, like you just were explaining, you know, looking at the positive side of it also. Plus that I think with history, as we go along, we find the flow of the positive and the negative coming in cycles and, you know, uh, life just moves. There isn't any time that is a stagnant place unless we make it stagnant in our own head. Uh, but life itself is not stagnant. And I've seen more flow um, many times with um, the elderly on a bigger issue. I mean, I've worked with a lot of elderly that they might get caught into one area of their life that just appears unresolved for them. But most of the people create this type of a flow. What was your experience as you were interviewing people? I think they have that flow because they understand that bumps in the road aren't an affront to the way the world's supposed to be. They're the way the world is. And they've had 70, 80, 90 years of experiencing that. And, and so when they hit those bumps, they accept them as life. And they don't uh, think that, oh, I'm special because I hit this bump and I'm going to marinate in the, my sense of loss in this speed bump. Uh, one of the women I spent time with, Ting Wong, uh, she had a lot of arthritis pain, and, and she, when I met her, she, the thing she was looking forward to more than anything was to spend the weekend, a weekend later in the summer, uh, with her family at Atlantic City. And as the date came around, she found she was in too much pain to get in the car and drive for three hours. It was just going to be too much. And I think that if she were younger, she might have just, you know, wallowed in that disappointment that she couldn't do this thing that she really wanted. But she just said, no, I'm just not going to do it because it would hurt too much. I'm going to get on with it. And then it turned out that a great-granddaughter from China, who she'd never met, was coming to the U.S. And, and so she said, well, for that, I will get in that car for three hours and go to Atlantic City. And she spent so much, you know, she was so wrapped up in the conversation with this great-granddaughter on the car trip down that she didn't notice the ride. So wow. I, that's the kind of simple way of adjusting to the world that the elders showed me, and Ping Wong more than anybody. Ping adjusted to the world as it, as it was with the body she had and the resources she had instead of wishing the world came at her differently or that she had a different body or different resources to deal with it. Another conversation that showed up with me as I was also reading your book is the idea that when we are younger, um, it's very important for us in about how people think. So sometimes we're nicer to them, although we don't want to be, or we change ourselves consistently just to be liked and be approved by the world. And at times, many times we need it because of our job or our social standing or just being, you know, wanting to be liked by the herd. And another aspect that I've watched for myself, in myself, and as I have uh, been with other people who are growing older, is that part of... I can stand on my own two feet and know that I am okay and I'm right to where I feel right. Um, and uh, it's okay if it's different than what other people want me to be or if other people want me to say a particular thing. That as long as what I'm doing is true to me and works for me, uh, that it's okay to let go of the need of approval from everybody else. And there's a confidence and like a sense of arrival, like I've arrived. I don't need to pretend anymore. Um, and, and that's liberating in a sense also. What is your experience of that? Isn't, isn't that a wonderful experience? And also to yeah. recognize that we don't need certain relationships in our lives, that we can kind of, there's people that are always going to be disapproving, always going to be, sort of bad for us in our lives, and when we're younger, we think, boy, we have to make that work, or I can't afford to give up that relationship because, you know, that person might be important to me in my career down the line. And you get a little bit older, and you say, I can just do that. I can, I can limit my circle. And who's brilliant on this is Laura Karstensen, who runs the Longevity Center at Stanford. And she says that as people get older, you know, sociologists tend to worry us, their social circles as older people's social circles shrink, but actually they're just curating their relations more, more finely, and they're spending their time, which is now limited, with the people who really are important to them. 
and they're not squandering their resources on the people who aren't. That is so true. I'm experiencing myself since I could even say about five, six years ago that I don't attend large parties anymore because obviously I'm a therapist and I create a lot of intimate uh, relationships with people who are my client. And then just going into these large parties with a lot of the chit chats just wasn't satisfying anymore. And I've watched myself be okay with just saying no to those. Uh, and like what you just experienced said, to go with a friend just to sit down and have that type of a one-on-one -on -one intimate relationship, which is satisfying to my heart. And uh, I've, I've seen this with a lot of people around me who are growing uh, to the same point you were making, that uh, the relationships are becoming more quality. Uh, because they're choosing it. They're choosing who they want to be with and how they want to be with. And um, and also their relationship with their mates, people who have a mate and they're together, even those relationships are becoming more and more uh, quality time of together being, they're not necessarily, hand, you know, with the chores of life or business of life and things they got to do. They're more just kind of like sitting and being together. What was your experience on that? Oh, I mean, I saw this, and there's also a lot of research on this, that, that marriages that are able to stay together for that long period of time, they just get stronger. You, you give up that idea that you wish your mate was more like uh, X, Y, or Z and say, my gosh, I'm glad to have that time with this person and have coffee in the morning. And that's a really special thing. Uh, so we see that getting stronger and stronger. Uh, the, of the folks that I spent time with, are, are sort of typical of that age group, and most of them did not have their mates anymore. But they did have somebody that they really cared about, and those, and they were able to organize their their uh, energies and center their lives on their time with those relatively small number of individuals who really made a difference for them. What's next for you? Uh, I've had such a great time. Uh, talking about the people in this book, and I've, I've been unable to let them go. I mean, I think that's one reason. It started off with a newspaper series, and one reason I wrote the book was I, I couldn't let the people go at the end of them. They meant so much to me. So I'm still enjoying that, and I'm not moving on to the next thing. I guess maybe I'm living in the moment. That is awesome. <laughs> um, if you had a purpose in this book, it's sharing. Uh, your experience with everyone around the world, what would that be? Well, I'm really immodest about this book because I feel like I was given something of tremendous value by the people, and I get to give it a away. And I think the, that first overarching lesson is that, you know, whatever hardships we face in our lives, whatever age we are, it's up to us to decide what role we want to give them in our lives. Do we want to make them the foreground? Do they want to make them something that's going on in the background? Not that we uh, pretend that they don't exist, but that they, they're, not, they're not life. They're just a piece of life. They're, they're uh, you know, an element in a life that has a lot of elements, and the spectrum's got a lot of colors in it. Thank you so much, John. Everyone, John Leland, the author of Happiness is a Choice You Make. Lessons from a Year Among the Oldest Old. And you can get that from Amazon.com. Um, how could they find you if they wanted to talk to you? I am uh, happinessisachoiceyoumake.com. And Wonderful. I would love to hear from people. And I'd love to talk to book groups and small groups and just meet people. And my gosh, folks out there, tell me about the amazing elder that's in your life. Or if you are that amazing elder, tell me about yourself. Say hi. Wonderful. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation. It's been a joy talking to you, and um, I hope that you will share with us whatever else experience that shows up your way. Well, thank you, and since my book is about the val is in part about the value of gratitude, thank you for giving me the opportunity to say thank you. It made my day. Absolutely. Great to have you. And it's time to talk to all of you, so call me at 951-922-3532. We'll be right back. Om 
Shanti is the language of the soul. Join the conversation every Monday afternoon at 3 p.m. Pacific for Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fushan. Dr. Fushan has a direct approach to getting you to free your mind. Inner Voice is a live call-in show where you can chat about your life and all that matters to you in your relationships. Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fushan, Monday afternoons at 3 p.m. Pacific on Smart Talk, KMAT, 1490 a.m. and on the Internet stream. Were you recently injured in a car accident? Then you need the law offices of REF Data Car for your free case evaluation. Don't let the medical bills pile up and don't let the insurance companies try to settle your claim for a few hundred dollars. Call 714-464-3246. The law offices of REF Data Car serves all of California. If they don't win, you don't pay. So call now, 714-464-3246. This is a paid-for attorney advertisement by the law offices of Aria Thadikar of Orange, California. Dr. Fujian Zane is a psychotherapist, a marriage and family therapist, and a life coach with more than 27 years of experience. She is the author of the Awareness Integration Model, which has been researched and published in numerous international journals. Dr. Fujian has offices in Beverly Hills, Irvine, and Woodland Hills, California, and also consults online and by telephone. Make an appointment with her today by calling 818-648-2140 or go online to www.fujan.com. That's www.fojan.com. Have you ever wished you could just wake up one day, reach across your nightstand, and hit the life reset button? Let's face it, the struggles and frustrations of everyday life leave millions of women and men around the globe yearning for a new way. And the new way is right here in Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want by Dr. Fujian Zane. You can get it now at fujian.com or amazon.com. Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want. You deserve it. Welcome back to the Inner Voice Show. I'm Dr. Fushan Zay, and we have Sarah online. Hi, Sarah. Good afternoon, doctor. Uh, thank you for your program. I had a, a question, and uh, I can't listen through the radio. Uh, yeah, it's a, basically, why do we dream, and how does it affect our life daily basis? Are you talking about dreams? Yes. Okay, your voice is, uh, there's some background noise, that's why I couldn't hear it. Um, you're interested in dreams. Is this something that consistently shows up for you, or do you dream? Do you remember your dreams? I remember my dreams, yes. Okay, and how does it affect you when you oh, have, and I'll tell you more as, as uh, uh, you know, about mm -hmm. dreams, but tell me a little bit about how dreams affect your life. Okay, um, okay, let me tell you how it happens. Like, um, whatever I dream in the morning, I don't remember it, right? But in the middle of the day, it's like a flashback. And uh, sometimes I just, it scares me. The dreams uh, show up as a symbol during the day and then it, yeah, it scares you? It's not like it was a bad dream. It's like uh, I see some stuff happening. And I, right there, I remember that it was in my dream. But why do I see it during the day? Why do I? Oh, okay. Do you write your dreams, Sarah? Uh, no, actually, uh, someone told me about it. I, n I never did that. Should I do that? I think it's a great idea. I had a class about dreams because we were trying to learn about dreams and dream analysis. And... Uh, for almost two years, I put a, a pen and a paper beside uh, my bed, and every time I dreamed and I woke up in the middle of the night or that I woke up in the morning, whatever I remembered, I just wrote. Sometimes with even 
closed eyes. I would just write and jot down a couple of sentences so that in the morning when I woke up that I could even with those sentences remember it. And then I would jot down whatever it was, even if it didn't make sense, even if it was all symbolic and, you know, um, a lot of it just had no relevant to reality, I would still write it because um, I think dreams are important part of us that uh, we our process the internal process is getting uh, getting integrated and then released and then within that as we are aware of our own process it's a part of self-awareness so the dream itself it does its job it releases it integrates all of the information that we got through the day and takes it to a filter through the night and uh, every phase, we dream uh, once about every hour. And uh, every time we dream, we process a part of us. So we'll filter everything that was unwanted pretty much through the day. We hold to the ones that were pretty much wanted. We also hold the ones that they're emotionally um, charged for us. Anything that happened during the day that emotionally either made us happy or upset or angry or sad or afraid, those are the ones that actually uh, are stored. And then they go and attach themselves to the other areas of our life and experiences that we've had um, since childhood and then picks up a lot of the abstract area. And that's where the abstract comes in our dream. As we uh, kind of dream through the night and get closer to earlier times uh, as we wake up, then a lot of our uh, wishes and uh, desires and everything that's been kind of um, uh, still not made, uh, you know, kind of unfinished, uh, that we want to do something about, again, shows up to uh, to kind of move us toward the uh, newness of the future. So at the beginning of the night, we're filtering through, we'll uh, completing the past, letting it integrate with the past. And as we're waking up in the morning, we are looking at wishes, desires, and things we got to do and tell ourselves to complete uh, about the future. So maybe the ones that you are remembering or kind of half remembering in the morning and then you let go, and then they start showing up during the day, it's because those are the ones that you actually have to do something about it, either emotionally or complete it, or their wishes that you need to do uh, some work around in order to gain it and then move forward. So watching your dreams tells you a lot about you. And especially because we have different parts of ourselves that at times um, we're aware of, or we have a lot of areas that we call subconscious, they're areas of us that we're not paying attention. Sometimes in the dreams, they come in and they say, look at me, um, notice me, take care of me. And those are the ones that also show up for you. And maybe during the day, suddenly you're like, oh, this is a part that's been coming up for me that I it hasn't been out there and I need to pay attention to it. Uh, maybe a part of me that was dormant, maybe uh, a strong part of me that needed to come up and take care. Uh, does that make any sense to you? So much, yes, doctor. Okay. Yes, so um, I'm going to start uh, basically writing them down as much as I can aware of it to see basically what's going on. Yes, yes. Sometimes, okay. um, Sarah... Uh, we lie to ourselves in our in our awakened time because maybe, uh -huh. for example, I want something and I don't want to look at letting it go. For example, some people around their career, some people around their relationships, some people uh -huh. around maybe, you know, their relationship with their own body, uh, any of those relationship with their siblings, parents anybody you see that there is a way that uh, they're feeling that is different from the way that they're acting uh, during the days so maybe there is a significant uh, reason in why they are acting the way they are 
but there's also this other part of them that is not as happy or there's not as integrated or doesn't see it the same way. Uh, sometimes in the dreams, the other part shows up and says, take care of me also. So if I'm in a relationship that doesn't work, but I'm not letting it go, in the dream keeps coming up as, hey, what about me? Take care of this other part that is not being handled in this relationship. Or if I'm in a job that I have to hold because of finances or something, but it's just not satisfying for me, then the part of me that's unsatisfied I will keep knocking at my dreams and say, hello, I'm here, do something, or I'm going to be very resentful after a while, and I'll sabotage you one way or another if you don't take care of me. So dreams are uh, a way of looking at all parts of us. So the decisions you'll make in your life and the actions that you create in your life, hopefully, will be something that takes care of all of you, because then they will be sustainable in time. If you're not and you're constantly kind of like caught up and kind of disconnected from yourself, the parts that you disconnected and kind of shoved in the back will start showing up and, you know, sabotaging your life one way or another. And then suddenly you're like, wow, where did that part come from? Does that make sense? Yes, so much. Thank you, Dr. Thank, Thank you, you so for much time. for being on the show. Thank you. I enjoyed So it. write Thank some you. of your dreams, Sarah, yes. and uh, come back. I will do good. A dream, juicy dream analysis okay. with you someday. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Bye, everyone. Um, if you are still listening to us, uh, call us at 951-922-3532. Love to hear from you and what's going on in your life. Um, it's been an interesting, interesting day. Um, I have started to really uh, enjoy online therapy now about no problem uh, i've really enjoyed online therapy now i wrote i co-wrote a book about online therapy in 2005 and we wrote that actually for therapists in 2005 i mean 13 years ago it was a beginning of uh, chat going back and forth and doing online therapy and all the laws weren't there yet and i guess i got into it because um, I was working with a lot of different ethnicities and from different countries, and it just allowed me to do um, online coaching, which, you know, people in the rural areas, which they didn't have experts there, and they found me and they wanted to chat. Now, from since then, we've had a uh, websites that are doing audio and they're doing uh, Skype, Zoom, uh, video, somehow they're doing that. So it's just made life much easier for us to be able to connect. And every day this has become more of a, a pattern of people where don't have time, they don't have time to drive, they don't have the expert they want around them, and they really want to talk to someone. So uh, uh, although I've had three offices and love to see people in my office face to face, but uh, really have started to expand the online coaching and online therapy. And I do online therapy for people who are in California and online coaching for people who are anywhere around the world. I'm really enjoying it. And um, Doctor, do you find people to be as open when you're talking to them online as you, as you would in person? Absolutely. And to be honest with you, what's interesting is, well, video... Sean does exactly the same thing as the uh, people who are in front of me. But what's interesting with audio, if they're on the phone or even chatting, typing, you know, this concept of like for when we have to look at each other face to face, we have to do all these cordial concepts of hello, how are you? And then they don't know what to say. And then they want to warm up to something. Right. I've noticed when they're chatting, they don't have to warm up. They go to the deepest conversation real quick and they're much more honest about what it is that is an issue. Maybe the concept of anonymity sometimes, and they're not face-to-face, -face, it allows them to drop the maybe the experience of shame or embarrassment. or Put all their guard that. down a little bit, basically. Yeah. They, they bring, bring their uh, guard down, and they go right to the point. And it's very efficient, uh, and I've really, really enjoyed it. I've had... Uh, this past two weeks, I've had so many online sessions that it's been back-to-back, -back, and I've really, really enjoyed it. 
more than any other times that I've enjoyed it. I think particularly because of what you just asked, Sean, and we talked about, is um, it's quick. Uh, they go into one conversation. They want some of the, you know, they want to know what the reasons are. Um, and then they get homework and they do homework and then they call me back, uh, you know, set up a time or they'll just chat back and forth. Um, and it's really worked. So for all of you who are out there, if you want, I'd love to do online chatting, online uh counseling or coaching with you. So just go to my website, fujan.com, and uh, email me, call me, and we'll set it up from wherever you are and wherever in the world you are. I think it works spectacular. And I do think it's the wave of the future, just, um, you know, being on internet and uh, sharing yourself. Thank you all of you for being with us. Thank you, uh, John Leland and Sarah and Sean for uh, sharing yourselves. And it's been a joy to be with all of you. Create a fantastic, fantastic week for yourself and everyone. And remember what John Leland said, happiness is a choice that you're making and go buy his book. I think it's an awesome book. I loved it. So until next week, take great care of yourself. Bye-bye. The Inner Voice Show is a dialogue between the host and the listeners about their relationships. This show is not an attempt to assess, diagnose, or treat any mental health or illness condition.